Molecular Geometry, Lecture 2. Now we're ready for valence bond theory. Valence bond theory. Folks, Vesper is, is nice. It tells us geometry. And Lewis is interesting, but they both have very, very significant limitations. They don't tell us how covalent bonds are formed. They don't allow for molecules like the, the diatomic lithium or the dihydrogen cation. Valence bond theory, which is also known as a localized electron model, is the first of two theories that we're going to look at that will possibly give us more information about this whole concept of bonding. Valence bond theory suggests that bonds are localized. That means they specifically lie between two nuclei, or they lie between two specific nuclei, whichever way you want to say it. The bonds form by overlap of atomic orbitals. Yeah, atomic orbitals overlap and form these bonds. And this overlap produces a volume of greater electron density. In other words, where the overlap occurs is where the electrons tend to reside a greater portion of the time. A single bond consists of only two electrons, each having opposite spins, which allows them to pair. In other words, a single bond contains spin-paired electrons. Now let's look at the formation of hydrogen. We're going to process energy against internuclear distance. And you're going to see this graph that I'm going to give you again. But I'm going to develop it backwards because I think it makes more sense to you when I do. So here's the way our graph goes, like this. Now look at this spot way out here. At this point, we have two hydrogen atoms that are separated in space from one another. And they have this amount of energy when they are out this far. As they come closer, you will notice that the energy is reduced until the energy reaches a minimum at a particular point. Then when you go beyond that point, on up here, the nuclei are getting closer and closer together. You're getting more and more overlap. And the nuclei are repelling each other. That's why the energy goes up. So as the atoms approach each other, and they get closer and closer, an overlap begins to occur. An overlap occurs to a significant extent. At that point, then, you have bonding occurring. That's when they're closer. And that's when they're the closest, and that's the point at which the energy is the lowest. They've given off energy to get there. They are more stable. That lowest point is called the equilibrium bond length. The bond length. Now, we're going to look at two different types of bonds. We're going to look at sigma bonds and pi bonds. And both of these are formed through overlap of atomic orbitals. So let's start with a sigma bond. And we're going to look at that hydrogen situation, kind of. The sigma bond is a bond that is cylindrically symmetrical about an axis connecting the two nuclei. I'll stop and let you get that down. The sigma bond is a bond that is cylindrically symmetrical about an axis connecting the two nuclei. Let's look at the overlap that we would get of two s orbitals, maybe in this case, two hydrogen atoms. The atoms approach each other, they collide, they overlap, and they form a bond. And there is the sigma bond. It is a bond that is cylindrically symmetrical about an axis connecting the two nuclei. Do you get the idea? The atoms collide, those orbitals overlap. They, there's an area in there that is an area of reduced energy. It is an area mostly between the two nuclei. It is cylindrically symmetrical about an axis connecting the two nuclei. And that is a sigma bond. 
Now suppose you have overlap of two p orbitals. Well, you're going to find there are two different ways they can overlap, but let's look at the end-to-end -end overlap. They collide, they overlap, and you can see that overlap. They form that bonding area. That's the area of greatest electron density. The electrons like being between those nuclei. That bond is cylindrically symmetrical about an axis connecting the two nuclei. Yeah, that is a sigma bond. Now, suppose you have overlap of an S and a B. They collide and overlap, and you can see where the overlap is occurring. And that area in there, that volume in there, is a sigma bond. The rest of it goes away. So when it forms this sigma bond, you see that it is on an axis connecting the two nuclei. Now let's look at a pi bond. A pi bond is a bond formed by side-to-side -side overlap of two p atomic orbitals. Side-to-side -side don't fit. You have the two p orbitals. Okay. They collide. You see where the overlap occurs. You get this and this volume of overlap. Now, folks, the pi bond is those two areas of overlap. It takes both of those to make a pi bond. It's not just one plus one, uh-uh. It's both of those together make a pi bond. And look where they're positioned relative to the nuclei. They lie above and below the line connecting the two nuclei. That is a pi bond. The sigma bond lies between the two nuclei. The pi bond is kind of between them, but it lies above and below. Let's look now at BeCl2, beryllium chloride. If you look at the electronegativity of beryllium and the electronegativity of chlorine, you will see that electronegativity suggests that it's covalent. If you look at Vesper, Vesper predicts 2 plus 2 is 4 divided by 2. Yep, predicts that it's going to be linear. Well, let's look at its electron configuration for a moment. Here's the electron configuration of beryllium. Now, folks, you're going to form BeCl2. Oh, huh. that doesn't look like a good prospect for covalent bonding, does it? I mean, the S is full. But what if, what if beryllium promotes one 2s electron to the 2p? Yeah, beryllium's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, but suppose that becomes 1s2, 2s1, 2px1. In other words, as it's beginning to come in for collision, there's more energy there, and the energy is expressed by an electron being promoted. Now, those two, that s and the px, are hybridized. In other words, instead of having an s, a 2s orbital and a 2px, suppose they hybridize. And they hybridize right there and make two what we call sp hybrids, two sp hybrids. And the electron configuration, well, it changes. It becomes, you can look at it either as 1s2, 2 sp with 1, sp with 1, or if you will, 1s2, 2sp1, sp1. Yeah. Well, what do those sp hybrids look like? Well, they look like this. There's one, and there's another one. See, they're kind of short and squatty. They're shorter and squattier than a normal p. It's got a little bitty back lobe. And when you put them together, they look like this. That's right. And there's beryllium in there. There's the beryllium nucleus in there. And you see... It can form then 
with two chlorines that can overlap with the atomic orbitals, the, the p atomic orbitals of chlorine to form bonds. And that is the linear molecule that Vesper is predicting. Look, look at it like this. Here we see beryllium. And here we see a chlorine atom on either side. And it's the chlorine, it's the, it's the, the PZ that only has one electron in it. So we see the chlorine PZ. So they overlap. And when they overlap, they form. See how the chlorines are in the beryllium? Overlap's going to form right there. Do you see? That's the bond that's formed. Yeah. Now, let's review what we know about this molecule. What kinds of bonds are these? Right here. They're sigma bonds. That's right, they're sigma bonds. How are these bonds formed? Well, <laughs> they're formed by the overlap of 3p atomic orbital of chlorine with a 2sp hybrid orbital of beryllium. Yeah. Does a molecule have a net dipole moment? Oh, good question. Well, let's see. Don't think so. Look, the electrons are pulled from beryllium toward chlorine in that direction and from beryllium toward chlorine in that direction. So there's, there's no net direction of, of movement of charge. So no, it doesn't have a net dipole moment. Interesting. More information. Let's fill this in now. When we have two areas of electron density, high electron density, the geometry is linear, the bond angles are 180 degrees, and what kind of hybridization is involved? And the answer is SP hybridization. All right, let's move on. Consider BCl3, boron trichloride. What do you think? Well, electronegativity indicates it ought to be covalent. And Vesper, Vesper predicts it to be trigonal planar. Well, let's look at boron's electron configuration. Boron's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2px1. Now, folks, how can that kind of an electron configuration hybridize to produce three equivalent hybrid atomic orbitals? Hmm. Perhaps we can move a 2s electron to the 2py. Well, let's have a look at that and see. We're going on the hypothesis that boron is going to promote one 2s electron to the 2py. So if that happens, then this boron electron configuration is going to become 1s2, 2s1, 2px1, 2py1. Now let's hybridize these right here. And when we hybridize these three parents, the S, the PX, and the PY, we get three hybrid offspring. Remember that. If you hybridize two parents, you get two hybrid offspring. If you hybridize three parents, you're going to get three hybrid offspring. And they are the SP2, the SP2, and the SP2. It has one part S character, if you will, and two parts P character. Got it? And the electron configuration then will become 1s2, 2sp2, sp2, sp2. And each of those sp2s has one electron in it. What do those sp2 hybrids look like? Well, they're kind of like the other hybrids we saw. They're kind of like the, the SP that we saw. They're just a little longer, maybe. And they fit at three points of a triangle. Here, here, and here. Do you get it? Remember, it's got that little bitty back lobe. So what you have then is boron in the middle, and here are the three areas that it can bond in. And when bonds are formed with chlorine, 
like this. They overlap. They form the sigma bonds. Yeah. Do you see how it works? And then the rest of that atomic orbital, if you will, is away. And this is what we have. All right. Huh, let's review what we know about this molecule. What kind of bonds are formed? Sigma. How are these bonds formed? Or rather, what forms them? Well, it's formed by overlap of 3p atomic orbital of chlorine with, with the 2sp2 hybrid orbitals of boron. There are three of those sp2 hybrid orbitals in there. Does the molecule have a net dipole moment? Well, let's see. We've got electrons being pulled in these directions. The thing, whole thing doesn't have a single direction. They all counteract each other. So does it have a net dipole moment? And the answer is no, it does not. So let's fill in the chart. And what is it? It's an sp2 hybrid orbital. That's right, sp2 hybrid. Let's go on. The tetrahedral, let's consider carbon tetrachloride. Now, when we try to construct the molecule and look at it, we will see that electronegativity tells us this should be a covalent molecule. And when we look at Vesper, it's predicted to be tetrahedral. Okay, that works. But carbon's electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2px, and 2py, each of which having one, has one electron. So how can this hybridize to produce four equal atomic orbitals? Well, maybe what we can do is move a 2s electron to the 2pz. Oh, let's have a look at it. Carbon promotes one 2s electron to the 2pz. Then that means that carbon's electron configuration will become 1s2, of course, that's already there, 2s1, 2px1, 2p1. Y1 to PZ1. Now we built the PZ, put one electron in there from the 2s, and now we're going to hybridize these four. Going to hybridize these four right here, and when we do, we are going to produce sp3 hybrid orbitals, orbitals that are a hybrid of 1s and 3ps. That's where that sp3 comes from. So our electron configuration then looks like this. 1s2, 2sp3 with 1, 2sp3 with 1, 2sp3 with 1, and 2sp3 with 1. Well, what are those sp3? Four of these bonded together at the four points of a tetrahedron. Do you see that? And the molecular model would look something like this, right there. Now, the bonds are equivalent. What are these bonds? These bonds right here between the carbon and the chlorine are sigma bonds formed by the overlap of the sp3 hybrid of carbon with the unhybridized p from chlorine. Got the idea? Okay, so when we fill in that spot on our chart, we put sp3, the sp3 hybrid orbital. All right, let's consider PCL5, and this is going to be our example then of the one that has five areas of electron density. Electronegativity says it's covalent. Vesper theory predicts trigonal bipyramidal to be the geometry. Phosphorus's electron configuration is, has a neon core, hence 3s2, px1, py1, pz1, and we need it to bond equivalently to five chlorines. How can it do that? Well, promote. Promote a 3s electron to, of all things, the 3d1. The 3D1, it's the first time we've brought in something different, isn't it? Let's look at that. 
Here we have phosphor with its electron configuration here. If it has to promote an electron, it's not going to do it any good to promote it to one of the P's. That's not going to give it five different positions. So it has to take it from the 3S to the 5D, to the 3D, I beg your pardon. And it hybridizes these parents right here. There are five of these parents. Now what are these parents? Well, they're DSP3. Or you could say SP3D if you would like. It doesn't matter. Neon with the it with the three DSP3, and there are five of those, each one having one electron, so they're ready to form five equivalent bonds. But now, folks, what's the geometry? The geometry is this trigonal bipyramidal. Five equivalent positions. And what is that bond? That bond right there is formed by the overlap of a DSP3 hybrid, which looks very much like the other hybrids we've been looking at, except maybe it's a little more elongated. It's a sigma bond, and it's formed by overlap of the DSP3 of phosphorus with the P from chlorine. Got the idea? So when we come over here then to our table, and we have the five areas of electron density, we put in for trigonal bipyramidal, DSP3 as our hybrid. All right, one more to go. But first, a thought question. Phosphorus can form PCL5. Phosphorus can form PCL5, but nitrogen cannot form in CL5. Why not? Think about that. Let's consider SCL6. Electronegativity indicates it's covalent. Vesper theory predicts an octagonal geometry. Well, sulfur's electron configuration is like this. It's neon with 3s2, 3px2, py1, and pz1. And it has to form six equal hybrid atomic orbitals. So what's it going to have to do? It's going to have to do a bunch of promoting. That's what it's going to have to do. Perhaps it can move a 3s and a 3px electron to the 3d1 and the 3d2, respectively. Yeah. Because if you added the 3D1 and the 3D2 to that, that would give you six parents. Yeah. Let's look at it. When we promote one of the 3S2 electrons and one of the 3PX2 electrons, we're going to come up with this kind of a configuration. Now we have one, two, three, four, five, six. The 3S, the 3PX, the 3PY, the 3PZ, the 3D1 and the 3D2, six parents to hybridize. We hybridize those and produce six of these D2SP3 parents. Do you see that? Six of them, and they're D2SP3. They're going to have two parts D character, three parts P character, and one part S character. Well, they're going to look kind of like the others, just maybe a little longer. Let's look at it. The geometry is going to be like this. And here I'm also showing you the model. Now what kind of a bond is that that forms between chlorine and sulfur when sulfur is hybridized? It is a sigma bond. It is a sigma bond that is the D2SP3 hybrid orbital overlapping the P of chlorine. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at it in the the photo or whether you're looking at it on the model. Got the idea? So when we look at our table and we see the octahedral geometry, we see that we're dealing with the D2SP3 hybrid. Are you getting the idea? In this problem, we're asked to determine the geometry 
best shape, type of bonds formed, and the overlaps producing those bonds for the compound SCl4. Well, let's start by seeing how many electrons we're dealing with and what kind of shape we'll be producing, or the, what kind of geometry. We have six valence electrons for sulfur. We pick up four from the four chlorines, giving us a total of ten divided by two means we have the geometry which is characteristic of five pairs of electrons. And that geometry is trigonal, bipyramidal, Sometimes I have to stop and think about how to spell this. Anyhow, trigonal bipyramidal, which means then that we have sulfur in the center, and we have a pair in this direction, a pair here, a pair here, and I'm going to draw this as what we call a flying wedge to indicate a pair of electrons coming out of the plane toward us and then to indicate the electrons going back behind the plane of the screen we use a dotted line. Now we have five areas of electron pairs. Where then are the chlorines going to go? Well, I think I'm going to put a chlorine here, a chlorine here, a chlorine here, and a chlorine here, which means of course that we have lone pair up here. Now that's one shape. Is there another shape? And the answer is, yeah, there, there's another possibility. We could have sulfur in the center. We have these five points again. And let's see. We can have, oh I know, we'll put chlorine on the axial bonds and on two of the equatorial bonds and what goes on the fifth position? And the answer is a pair of electrons. All right, there they are. There's the, two, there's the pair of electrons. Now, which is the better shape? Well, let's go through and determine how many lone pair, lone pair, 90 degree interactions we have. And let's start with this one over here. Well, when we start with this one and we look for 90 degree lone pair, lone pair interactions, we only have one pair of lone pair electrons, so we can't have any lone pair, lone pair interactions. So there are zero lone pair, lone pair interactions here. And over here on the other one, it's the same situation. You only have one pair of lone pair, so you can't have lone pair, lone pair interactions. So this is zero, lone pair, lone pair. All right, so the two are equivalent in that respect. Now let's look at 90 degree lone pair bond pair interactions. And we'll start with the one on the left. Well, we have lone pair, lone pair, we have lone pair, bond pair interactions there at 90 degrees. We have it there at 90 degrees and we have it there at 90 degrees. So we have three lone pair, bond pair interactions there. All right, let's look at the other one. Now we're looking for lone pair, bond pair interactions again. 90 degrees, where we have an interaction there, and we have an interaction there, and none of the others are at 90 degrees. So this is two lone pair, bond pair interactions. So it looks to me, folks, like this right here is the better shape. Got the idea? That is your better shape. Now let's see. We've got the geometry and we've got the best shape. What kind of bonds are these that are formed? And what are the overlaps that are producing those bonds? Well, let's have a look at that. 
So let's look at this shape. We've got the sulfur to a lone pair here. We've got it to a chlorine here. We have it to a chlorine here, to a chlorine here, and a chlorine here. Now what are these? This right here is a sigma bond. And it's a sigma bond that's formed from the overlap of a D SP3, yeah, DSP3, bonded to what is the one from the chlorine? And it's a P. And this one right here, that is likewise a sigma bond that is formed from a DSP3 of sulfur to the P of chlorine. And the same thing goes for this one right here and for this one right here. So they are all sigma bonds formed by the overlap of a DSP3 of sulfur to a P of chlorine. Now, while we're about it, what kind of a shape have we got? What's the actual shape of this molecule? Let's look at this for a second and see if we can figure it out. We have a chlorine bonded to a sulfur, bonded to a chlorine, and then the sulfur is bonded on the flying wedge to another chlorine, and on the dotted wedge to another. Do you see that? Do you see what I see there? Do you see that you're looking at a seesaw? Yeah, it's a seesaw. That concludes Lecture 2. In Lecture 3, we're going to talk about molecular orbital theory after we do a brief discussion of multiple bonds. A better way to teach and learn chemistry.